Hello there and a very warm welcome to KTN's news desk on this 23rd day of December. Just one more day to go to Christmas. I've been that person reminding everyone, just in case you've forgotten, we're just about there on Christmas Day where Christians celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. We're glad you could join us this afternoon for the news. I'm Sophia Wanuna. Let's get started with a look at our top stories. Senate and National Assembly speakers issues writs declaring vacancies for the seats of new cabinet secretaries. And reckless drivers put on notice over the festive season. Plus, is there any hope for Kenya's tourism industry in the coming year? Let's get started with the human rights group says independent experts should investigate Burundi's forces for alleged human rights violations including extrajudicial executions, rape and looting in the unrest of a president Pierre Nkurunziza's extended tenure. Amnesty International is calling for investigations as Burundi's top security body rejected the African Union's plan to deploy peacekeepers to the Central African nation to prevent the violence from escalating. Amnesty International says the security forces' violent tactics on December 11 represented a dramatic escalation in the scale of previous operations. But it does appear that there were certainly a number of extrajudicial executions that took place that day, carried out by police, and other killings in circumstances which would indicate that they may have been extrajudicial executions as well. On December 11th, an unidentified group attacked three military installations. Burundi security forces responded by going on a rampage in parts of the capital, Bunjumura, regarded as centers of the opposition. In all, 87 people died. Most of those killed were residents of districts mostly inhabited by minority Tutsis, Amnesty International said. Uh, it was very similar to what we've been seeing over the last few months. We've seen an intensification of violence with numerous killings. Um, it's become almost normal in the most mornings to wake up in Bujumbura and to expect to find dead bodies in the street. We see mass arbitrary arrests people going missing, their family members not knowing where they are. Burundi's government has denied abuses, saying its troops acted professionally. Burundi has been hit by deadly unrest since the ruling party's April announcement that Nkurunzinza would seek a third term in office. The announcement was followed by street protests that boiled over into a failed coup in May. Nkurunzinza was re-elected in July, but the violence has since increased. In response to Burundi's escalating crisis, the African Union authorized the deployment of 5,000 peacekeeping troops to Burundi. Burundi's government has rejected the AU decision. Ellen Wanjiro, KTN News. Let's bring it back to Kenya now. And Parliament speakers have issued writs to the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission declaring Kericho Senate and Malindi parliamentary seats vacant. This for the electoral body to prepare for by-elections in the two regions. Senate Speaker Ekwe Ethiro has declared the Kericho senatorial seat vacant following the appointment of former Kericho Senator Charles Kater to the energy docket. This as his parliamentary counterpart Justin Muturi sent it to the IBC to declare the Malindi parliamentary seat vacant following the appointment of former Malindi Member of Parliament Dan Kazungu into the mining docket. The two were appointed into cabinet following President Uhuru Kenyatta's reshuffle of his cabinet after sacking six of his cabinet ministers implicated in graft allegations. Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, has left the world waiting and guessing yet again on whether he will run for the office of the president in 2017 following a resounding yes vote for the proposed new constitution that allows him to possibly remain in office up to 2034. KTN's Eugene Nangwe attended the press conference and now joins us with more details. 
The 13th edition of the annual National Dialogue has come to a close right in Kigali, Rwanda. The climax being a press conference with both local and international press by President Paul Kagame. At the press conference, a variety of issues were raised, including the just concluded national referendum, Burundi, among other issues. Yes, but in our case, particularly in Rwanda, in actual fact, you can make your own research, or maybe you have already. We have come to this point where we are having a constitutional review and people saying this, and mainly from those people are not from me. Absolutely not. I'm sure, in fact, if people wanted to change their, 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 their decision, they say, you know what, we've wasted a lot of time, we have discovered that uh, it is not necessary, you would see how I, I would jump on that without any hesitation. As of critics of the country, President Paul Kagame made it clear that it is only Rwandans that will determine their destiny. You find, you know, people are not coerced, they are not you know, told what to say, they said it themselves, and then you, say, you know what, no, but there was something wrong because it was done hastily. So I don't know what history means now. <laughs> The referendum was done in history. When they are the same people for the last two years, we've been complaining about this matter. So it becomes history. So when should it have come? And maybe for those who've been waiting to hear a yes or a no from the president on whether he would be vying for office again in 2017, this is what he had to say. By the way, Although we are ending 2015, we are still in 2015, isn't it? Uh, and this whole thing we are talking about has a decision point at 2017. So I'm really comfortable in my seat. <laughs> at least this, the remaining two years are not disputed. <laughs> so I'm comfortable there and uh, uh, for as we go on, I'm just trying not to be to allow to be diverted from what we have to do with these debates that started far back in, in time. Um, so we we'll see. We'll keep debating and. The ongoing crisis in Burundi also made its way in the press conference, with President Paul Kagame making it crystal clear that Rwanda can only do much. Uh, first of all, those neighbors have responsibility themselves to uh, resolve their problems. Short of that, uh, if there is any intervention to be uh, carried out, then uh, it's done in a much wider context, uh, uh, whether it is the region or the continent or the world body, as I said, like the UN, then uh, it's up to them. But so Rwanda can you contribute in any way required, uh, but uh, this is not really a, It's our concern, but it's not our responsibility. So it seems that President Paul Kagame may not just be going to make a pronouncement on whether he would be running for office again in 2017 or not. At least, not for now. Merry Christmas and uh, Happy New Year. All the best to you and your families. For KTN News in Kigali, Rwanda, I'm Eugene Anangwe reporting. Kenyan public service vehicle drivers have been put on notice during this festive season. Licenses of drivers caught speeding will be revoked. This is according to the National Transport and Safety Authority. The director, Francis Major, says many public transport operators have tampered with the speed governors in their vehicles. The authority has launched a crackdown on public transport vehicles during the festive season.
sensitization across the whole country, free. And we went further and gave a notice to PSV operators that should your vehicle be caught with an unfunctional governor, you will lose your road service license. In addition, the driver of that vehicle will lose class A, which allows them to drive PSV or commercial vehicles. Despite that, this thing is still there. All these vehicles you have seen are affected because of that. So they will lose their license, which means they will not be able to do PSV business. The next thing is that the driver of that vehicle will lose class A driving license, which means they will not be allowed to drive PSV. And we are doing this because we have in, been in discussion for far too, far too long, and the time for action is now. Uganda's former Prime Minister Mamambaba's security detail has been blamed for the recent violent clashes in Tungamu district that left several people injured. The clash was allegedly proved, uh, provoked by supporters of NRM candidate and Uganda's president, Joweri Museveni, who are said to have disrupted Mbabazi's rally in the Western District. Our reporter, Salman Sarwanja, has those details from the campaign trail in Uganda. Violent clashes described former Prime Minister John Patrick Amama Mbabazi's presidential rally in Intungamu last week as the presidential hopeful searched for votes in one of NRM's strongholds. <laughs> Mbabazi's security detail and supporters seen beating up President Museveni's enthusiasts for allegedly disrupting the former Premier's rally and defacing his posters. This series of events have redefined the electoral process, taking a violent turn, with either parties vowing to revenge. If you go and you put your finger <laughs> in the anus of a, of a leopard, you are in trouble. You, you, you are attacking other people in Uganda here. If you do it in South Sudan, in Kenya, yes, we may have some problem. But here, where do you go? And I would like to advise him, please, panicking is not an option. We have demonstrated right from Arua, in fact, right from Masaka, where the intimidation started, that this will not achieve the desired results. The police is blaming Babazi's security detail for the violence and have vowed to dislodge them. In fact, three of them have been arrested, according to Babazi's camp. At the center of the controversy are the men in black who have been hired to protect the former premier against any harm. It is, however, the responsibility of the Uganda police to protect all presidential candidates, according to the Electoral Commission. We had been giving him security even before he became a candidate. So there is no excuse really for, and there is no reason for having these vigilantes around them. And we are not going to accept it anyway. The presence of the security detail leaves many questions unanswered. Who has the mandate of protecting Babazi? How far can the security detail go to protect the principal? Are they legally recognized in the electoral process? Security expert Moses Matsiko gives his mind on Babazi's security. A private security person uh, or escort for that matter, private or civil, is to protect the principal, in which case the principal would be the, um, the, 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 the person who would be campaigning. If and when what we saw is uh, indeed right, that people got out, moved away from their principal, and attacked the other people across the road or anywhere where they were, then that was an act of aggression and it can only be described as violence. The executive director of Pinnacle Security Company adds that they have a limit to their operation. They need to desist from performing, getting themselves involved in a violence that is outside their mandate. What we see in that footage 
is people stepping out of the given mandate that is working, thinking on the assumption that they're private security guards belonging to Amam Ambawazi and performing a duty that completely is violent. He, however, blames the police for not drawing a line between the civilians and Mbawazi's security team. Matsiko's concerns may fall on deaf ears from Babazi's camp, who insist that they will protect themselves once provoked. <laughs> Solomon Serwanja, KTN News. Kampala, Uganda. The raw materials in Africa have for decades been exported to Europe for processing, only to be re-imported back into the continent. But Uganda's chocolate makers are looking to reverse this trend by keeping production on home soil. It's a Valentine's Day drug of choice and triggers the same brain responses as falling in love. But how many consumers spare a thought as to where their chocolate comes from? 68% of the time, the cocoa beans that create Nestle, Hershey, and Godiva's finest come from small family farms in Africa, with a third of the global supply coming from the cacao fields of Ivory Coast. Until now, East Africa has exported far less than their Western neighbors. But Ugandan entrepreneurs and childhood friends, Steven Simbuya and Felix Okuye, are trying to change that. After inheriting his family's plantation, Stephen launched Pink Food Industries and has ambitions of climbing the global chocolate rankings. It's, it's ranked fifth in Africa at the moment and we're able to produce close to 20,000 tons per year. And so because of the, the promotion we're doing, we're pretty sure that in the next uh, five years it, it could be able to, to double given the the climate, the good climate we have here in uh, Uganda. But rather than just producing cocoa for export, Stephen and Felix not only process the beans locally, but also sell their chocolate, cocoa powder, and cocoa butter directly. Charles Osisi, who supports the government in their goal of promoting small and medium-scale businesses, says that when raw cocoa is exported, 80% of its potential value goes with it. A cocoa plant that is harvested and is sold as a raw commodity will go and create a job in a country where it has been exported to for people who do the entire value chain addition. So the only thing we have done in the entire value chain of a cocoa, a cocoa product is just to grow it. Cocoa cultivation was introduced in Uganda nearly a hundred years ago and output peaked in the 1960s. Decades of government neglect, a lack of finance, and price fluctuations throttle the sector, though. And it's only now that the government is again pushing cocoa production, which experts say is more profitable for farmers than coffee. For now, Stephen and Felix are selling their product in the Ugandan capital, Kampala, but hope to extend their market across the country, and eventually beyond. The process comes with a cost, and uh, if you have no patience, it gets weary and you can easily give up. But uh, we had a, having a dream, seeing the niche, almost chocolate worth uh, 15 to 20 million dollars and cocoa products is being imported. So as such, there is money we can tap into. So that's our drive, that this product has something good out there. With each wrapped foil bar that they bring to the market, these wannabe cocoa kings hope to take a step closer to making Uganda synonymous with chocolate.